All right, everyone, welcome back into another NFL DFS video. Going to be touching on the top showdown plays here for this Thursday night showdown between the Seattle Seahawks and the San Francisco 49ers. Let's go and get into it. And so, as always, I'd like to start off with a little bit of a game preview. And what we can notice about this game is that it's going to be one of the highest scoring games of the week. So the game total is going to be set at 49 total points in this game. It's also projected to be a close scoring game, three and a half points the Niners are favored by. Now, there's no real reason to pull up any sort of injury report. Both teams are relatively healthy in terms of kind of what we'd be expecting. No surprise injuries, and we're not going to really be targeting anyone as a result of those injuries. So what I do want to look at is going to be the snap counts for kind of each team's. And so let's start off with looking at the Seattle Seahawks running back snap counts. And what we'll notice is that uh, Kenneth Walker actually got a lot of work last week and they didn't really give him a lot of work. So he got a lot of snaps, but didn't get a lot of carries. I would argue that was a mistake in the game. Kenneth Walker didn't look bad. Zach Charbonnet actually, actually thought really looked good. It probably should have been maybe more a little bit as Zach Charbonnet rather than Kenneth Walker, just given the looks that they were trying to uh, use with their offense. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if those two get a little bit more work or not, maybe together on the field. But I doubt that will happen because we've just been seeing a lot of three receiver sets. It's going to be a lot of DK Metcalf, JSN, and Tyler Lockett. Last week, DK Metcalf kind of had a rough, rough week, I would say. I mean, he was still solid, don't get me wrong, but he had a bad fumble, maybe a fumble that somewhat changed the outcome of the game. I don't know. Last week was weird for both teams, both the Niners and the, the Seahawks. Both could have won after kind of just not playing all too well. So it'll be interesting to see kind of which version of each team we get. I kind of expect because last week was a letdown for both teams. They'll both kind of step up and play better this week. But no surprise in terms of snaps for receivers. I do want to call out Noah Fant was back up to 69% of the snaps last week. And I bring that up because it did seem like AJ Barner was starting to work himself into a bigger role. And so that is interesting. One thing that also is interesting to note is when we switch into the Niners snap counts, we're going to notice that the receiver snaps. Jawan Jennings back down to around 50, let's just say 57, 56 percent of the snaps. So 60 percent of the snaps, which is kind of what we come to expect from him. So with Debo Samuel healthy, with Brian Ayuk healthy, we have seen Jawan Jennings kind of take a, a backseat role, if you will. And that's been happening on the field. We've been able to notice that in terms of tight end play, George Kittle. You know, when he's healthy, he's going to be playing a bunch. We like that. But here's the thing, guys. When we have Brian Ayuk, George Kittle, and Debo Samuel healthy, it typically leaves one of them out of the equation. And so for DFS purposes and or betting purposes, it, it makes it more difficult because one of the two, or sorry, one of the three most likely will not have a great game, kind of what they're projected to do. And another one of them might have a big spike in their production. We saw that last week with Brian Ayuk finally going off. And it was George Kittle that scored the touchdown. And then last week, Jordan Mason kind of came back down to earth. 64% of the carries didn't score a touchdown. He didn't look bad, though. He kind of looked like he's looked this whole year. And so let's go ahead and get into the slate. We're going to start out with the San Francisco 49ers here. And I will find it a little bit interesting that Jordan Mason is the highest priced player on the slate. We saw what kind of happens to him when the Niners are not playing with a, a lead. Now, he still looked good. Like, uh, it's he's just a little bit too high priced. Because when I'm looking at this, I see Debo Samuel that cheap. I see Brian Ayuk that cheap. And I see George Kittle that cheap, who, who does have a questionable tag. He's going to be good to go. I would much rather play like all three of those. And I know I just said, well, typically speaking, you're only going to play two of them because only two out of the three are going to have a good game, which is true. But I would rather just play like all three of them in general and just two of them in a build rather than get to Jordan Mason. So really my captain strategy, at least for the Niners specifically, is going to be to play Diego Samuel in the captain spot. Brian Ayuk in the captain spot. George Kittle in the captain spot. And for now, I'm probably just going to go with George Kittle since he's the lowest priced player of that group. But really, all of them, I would say, are warranted options. And so I'm going to put Brian Ayuk in there as well. Uh, Brock Purdy, I don't mind as a play. I would argue last week, he just wasn't really settled in, it almost seemed like. It was, I don't want to say it was his worst start as an NFL starter because it wasn't terrible, but it definitely wasn't great. He did leave some to be desired. But again, both teams, there wasn't like a, a pinpoint reason as to why they lost, I would say. N neither team just seemed fully sharp, if you will. And that carried over with Brock Purdy. I don't mind Brock Purdy at that price tag. He should be a solid producer. Again, that was like one of his worst starts recently. And he still ended up with 15 fantasy points. So like, we'll take that, especially on a showdown slate. So from there, I do want to call out that Jake Moody is going to be out. 
And they did recently just put in the kicker that they just called up, Matthew Wright. And so we do know that the kicker has kind of been a valuable spot for the Niners. And so it wouldn't be surprising to see a random kicker like that have a good game. So we are going to want to have him in some of our builds. Now, Isaac Garendo did get a little bit more work. Um, I don't think he's going to be someone that we're looking at. I guess I just want to be shocked if he scores like a random touchdown. Same thing with go for Kyle Juszczyk, although with everyone healthy, we are going to see him take more of a backseat role. So he's someone that, you know, if one of the stars are out, Debo, Kittle, Ayuk are out. I'm fine getting to him, but with everyone healthy, uh, there's no reason to be targeting him. And that's the thing, guys. Like These teams are just very much concentrated in terms of who's going to get the production. So in a weird way, that makes it easy to know who to be on, but also it does make it hard to make is, and I would argue that's why we had such a good week, especially content-wise, guys, Thursday, Sunday, Sunday night, and then Monday night. So London game as well. Extremely good content, I would say. Some of the best... I've had, you know, a little soft pat on the back there. Part of that was due to just teams having injuries and you kind of know who to go to because of that. Jalen Tolbert, for example, knowing to be on him. We don't have that. And so it is kind of just all about lineup process. And so this will be probably more of a lineup builder type week rather than uh, here's where we have great value. This is where we're going to get our biggest edges on the slate. And I would argue the biggest potential edges that we have on the slate is going to be between the pricing of Zach Charmonade. Again, he looked good. He's going to get involved in the passing game. We know that. Um, he's someone that we can use in, in some game script builds as well. Let's say if we're loading up on Kittle, Ayuk, and then you have Brock Purdy, I would argue Zach Charmonade makes a lot more sense in a build like that because you're running it back with someone that presents more of a game script build. Because if the Seahawks are playing from behind, we're going to see more of Zach Charmonade in that build. So at that price sake, he's certainly in play. Uh, Noah Fant got three targets in that game. Again, played a little bit more. Not exactly sh- sure what's... Honestly, it seems like random. Uh, again, AJ Barner was someone that two games ago against Detroit, the broadcast crew really made a point of emphasis of bringing up that the coaching staff was breaking about him. And so they, they do clearly like him. So it wouldn't be surprising to see him get some work. I actually don't mind Barner as a value as well for that reason. But we might as well just get to Noah Fant there as well. So those are probably the two best values for now. I'm going to put Zach Charmonade in there. Now, I will say, Kenneth Walker, I really just like as a talent. He got so many targets in that game. It did feel like a mistake for him to get that many targets, although he looked good. Uh, to me, guys, he's he's one of the most talented running backs in the league. Obviously, I want to get to him. And I do find it crazy that he is cheaper than Jordan Mason, especially if they're going to both play about 70% of the snaps. Like I would just much rather get to Kenneth Walker then. From there, we got Geno Smith. We kind of got a typical Geno Smith Seattle Seahawks game last week where kind of, I don't want to say poor play out of Geno, but just as a whole, the team, again, not all there, kind of promoted more of a second half comeback. They almost completed the comeback. Um, The biggest thing with Geno is that he has been rushing the football a little bit more, Uh, but that was a little bit due to coverage. You could tell that it was all about keeping everything in front, the defensive strategy. And so with that, it did lead a little bit to Geno having some room to rush the football for some big games, especially especially as the game progressed, because Tyler Lockett did have a decent downfield target. But for the most part, I think we are going to see that same strategy by the Niners. And so maybe that'll lead to Geno Smith having some easy rushing lanes. But at the same time, I just think that's going to promote more of a, a passing script for a lot of these receivers, a lot of short yardage catches. And so that means... Tyler Lockett's firmly in play. And I will say, there's no reason why Tyler Lockett should be this much cheaper than Jackson Smith and Najigba because they are playing about the same role. I know Najigba has had some of the bigger spike weeks with 12 targets and 16 targets. I get that. And I get that that's why he's higher priced, as he should be. But it shouldn't be this crazy because they are playing about the same. Like Tyler Lockett has been good. If Tyler Lockett wasn't afraid of contact so much so, he would have had a touchdown last week. It was kind of a, a bad play by him. But I'm happy to get to Tyler Lockett here. He feels a little bit too cheap. And then from there, DK Metcalf, I feel happy to get to. And look at that. Look at this, guys. We have so much average salary remaining over. And we're arguably getting a lot of the top plays on the slate. So obviously in this build, go up from Zach Charmonade. Then we can get to to Debo. Again, I don't want to play all three of those together. So I I would maybe adjust this. But that's how easy a a build is. And so maybe we just get off a Kittle. I could get to Tyler Lockett then in the captain spot. Then obviously in a build like this where we're going three receivers and no running back for Seattle, we would want to go with Geno Smith. And again, we still have $900 left over. That Again, that's how easy it is to make a quality build for this showdown slate. So that kind of concludes my 
personal view of this site, let's go ahead and jump into the nine to five lineup builder, see what that's telling us to do. And so again, just to make this uh, run, we're going to give it two data points to go off of. I'm going to bump up Kenneth Walker because I do view him as one of the better plays on the slate. Let's bump him up to 21 as well. Love getting to him. And I'm also going to bump up his flex projection. And then we're just going to rush uh, run this. And so what the top lineup is right now would be Brock Purdy, the captain spot, Geno Smith, George Kittle, Jason Myers, the kicker for Seattle, Jawan Jennings. I don't know if I love Jawan Jennings that much. I'd maybe change it. And then Jordan Mason. But again, that kind of reiterates just how easy it is to make a good build. Let's look at another build that's basically the same, but without um, Jawan Jennings, we have Zach Charbonnet. That, that It's easy to make a good build. I, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this slate, just given we can make some good game script builds, but also it's going to be easy to fit the top pieces. Now that could mean that the GPP winning lineup probably will be duped. I am assuming it will be because there's just not as, I mean, there's a lot of variables, but there's not as like, there's not going to be a random like Juju Smith Schuster type game going off. Most likely. Unless it's like AJ Barner <laughs> getting more snaps. But guys, that's going to be all for today's video. Appreciate you guys being here. If you guys want access to the 9to5 lineup builder or any of the NFL DFS tools or prop tools, head on over to 9to5sports.com. Get access to all those tools for just $10 a month. Take advantage of that if you guys are making